we are in R1. So I have one dimensional space. And in one dimensional space, I obviously have the integers. We are going to pick only integers. So my question is this. How many integers to pick so at least one of the midpoints of the selected integers is an integer. <coughs> For example, if I picked 0 and 1, what's the midpoint? 0. 0.5. 0. 0.5, it's not an integer. But if I picked 0 and 2, what's the midpoint? 1. What if I picked, but on the other hand, what if I picked uh, negative 2, negative 1, and 2. Negative 2 and negative 1, what's their midpoint? That's negative 1 half, that's not an end. Um, what about negative 1 and 2? Well, in other words, okay, let's might as well draw it. So if I pick this one, this one, and this one. I get this midpoint, that's not an integer. Between these two, I get that midpoint, that's not an integer. But between these two, I get what? That midpoint, which is an integer. How many points can you pick or should you pick? Is it an infinite number or what? Is it one? Is it two? What's the minimal number that you have to pick to guarantee that if you pick at random, that you always have an integer midpoint? And now comes the question of, like, this one was three, right? Why? All right, now we've got to go through this. If, I'm, if this is in the pigeonhole principle section, that means that this is going to have objects, and this is going to have boxes. And we're going to have to go through this a little bit and ask, all right, how did I know that between these two, the midpoint was not an integer? Right by each other, right? But how do you find midpoint? What's a midpoint? I, I'm using words like midpoint. What's a midpoint? So the midpoint of x1 and x2 is x1 plus x2 divided by 2. That's the first thing I understand. The second thing is what am I looking for? I want to have what? I want a midpoint that is an integer. Well, if you're telling me that you want x1 plus x2 divided by 2 to be equal to an int, what does that tell you about x1 and x2? That their sum, right, that the addition of the two, that's telling me that that really says that x1 plus x2 must be equal twice an int, which happens to be what? even. Oh wait, so I want x1 plus x2 to be even, but those are two numbers. Well, I know how to add things to get evens. How do you add things to get evens? Add two evens or add two odds. What if I do an odd and an even? Then you get an odd. And so what I know now is, it's like, so I look at this and I say, oh, oh wait, wait, wait. Numbers are even or even or odds. And so three is we know that even plus even is even, and odd plus odd is even, even plus odd is odd, and odd plus even 
is odd. So really what we just said is midpoint is an integer really means that when I add my two numbers, I get an even, which really means that two numbers must be what? Both odd or both even. That's called the term same parity, right? They both are odd or both are even. And so when does this, so this happens. Only happens when we have two, at least two, right? That have same parity. The term parity means even or odd. So my entire problem is actually this. You sit there and say, I want to add these two numbers and I want to get an integer midpoint. What you just said is really, how many numbers do you pick to guarantee at least two have the same parity? Well, how many parities are there? Two. So how many numbers do we need? Three. Three by the pigeonhole principle. Who said three at the very beginning? Everybody okay with that? So this problem became, we have to go through all that little work, and it ends up being that so the objects are just simply the numbers to pick, but the <coughs> boxes are the parodies, which it was even or odd. There's only two of them. So that tells me if I pick three, at least three, then at least one parity, I don't know if it's even or odd, has at least two numbers. And if that happens, therefore those two of same parity have int midpoint. Let's go back to our example. I picked negative 2, negative 1, I picked an even and an odd. Right? For these, any off of 2's, right, we start off with 0's, we talk about divisibility of 2, and so we get 0, negative 2, and, negative, and positive 2. But, since I picked positive 2, that immediately tells me that the negative 2 and the positive 2 have an integer midpoint. Why? They're the same parity. I don't even have to check. So it's pigeonhole principles are very subtle. What's nice about the pigeonhole principles are, what did I need to know about the numbers that the person selected? So if a person comes up here and says, I'm going to be really fancy. I'm going to pick number 1. I'm going to pick 7. It's like, I don't care how fancy you are. I don't need to know anything about the numbers you pick. I just need to know that you pick three. All I need to know is cardinality. And just from cardinality, I get information about the problem. That's a pretty amazingly powerful thing. It's like, well, wait a second. What if I want to pick? I don't care what you pick. I guarantee this will happen. So problems of this nature. Um, how many students would you need to guarantee that at least three of them have a last name that starts with the letter A. If I have 26, worst case scenario is what? A to Z. But the moment I have 27, right, sorry, not the letter A. Uh, same letter and last name. At least three people have the same letter in their last name. I would have two people if I had 27, right? I don't know which. I would have doubling. The moment I have 52, worst case scenario is I have two A's, two B's, two C's. But the moment I go to 53, I guarantee there's at least three. So that thing I handed around, if 
I have 53 students, I know that at least one of those slots will have at least three envelopes in it. Let's try that example. Um, how about this? How many students to have at least five with the same first and last initials. For example, my name is Mark Aerosmith, so I'm MA, right? So how many students would I have to have, so if they would initial their stuff, that I would guarantee that at least five initials are the same? Well, obviously, what are my objects? Students. What are my boxes? It's the initials, right? I say MA. Mark goes into the MA slot. Right? This is the initials. How many initials are there? There's 26 squared, right? 26, 26. So there are 26 squared initials that could exist. Now, what do I want? I want to know when is the first time that, if I want to use this generalized principle, generalized pigeonhole principle, when is the first n that when I divide by the number of boxes, ceiling, and it spits out what? When's the first time that happens? Very good. And must be 26 squared times 4 plus 1. Look like the, the look, does it look like the division rule? It is the division rule, right? I'm breaking everybody up into 26 squared boxes. Worst case scenario is I have four in all the boxes. When's the next time I have five? That remainder of one, he has to go somewhere. So it's just an application of the division rule. So whatever that is. Again, normally I would like you to just simply leave it like that, but you can always just do the arithmetic. <laughs> But you don't want to do that, Ricky? <laughs> oh, that reminds me. I was so tempted on this. Some people see this. Power does not distribute. I would say nearly half the class distributed the power. All right? This will be very, very, very important because we're about to do the binomial theorem. All right? <laughs> In binomial theorem, sum of two things raised to a power. No power, no distribute. I should act like one of the professors here has one of those things where every time he runs into that, he just writes zero for the whole test and hands it back. <laughs> and it's like, if it got to the point, it was like one of those things where it's like, you can't make this mistake anymore. Zero, here you go. Yeah, it's master's level. <laughs> it's like these are people that are supposed to be teaching this. And they make arithmetic mistakes, and it's like zero. I'm not even going to worry about it. <laughs> At which the people are like, ah, like, no. Oh. <laughs> so are we okay with that? Please make sure you can do it. I can't do arithmetic, but you need to do arithmetic. I can't even add. Anyways. So the pigeonhole principle is understanding the generalized, being able to state it, and trying to find out the, the variations. Uh, in the book for... This even oddness. The book has two star problems, I think both of which I assign. Um, talks about like R2, right? If we're in two dimensional space, what has to happen? The ordered pairs have to have same parity, like even, even, odd, odd, right? And then it would divide by two. But if you have parities in, in pairs, you'd have four combinations. You could pick even, 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 odd, odd, even, odd, odd. So we have four boxes, right? <laughs> And on the other hand, what if I was in three-dimensional space? How many parodies exist in three-dimensional space? Even, 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 odd, even, odd, even, even, odd, odd. There's going to be what? 
This can be a. In nth dimensional space, it's going to be just 2 to the nth. So how many points do I need? 2 to the nth plus 1. So you can kind of generalize that problem. There are several things, like when we get into discrete 2, there's always interesting features of problems where I can know nothing about the specifics but still state very useful statements about the problem and just knowing the cardinality.